how your team is supposed to be modeled. You should be a defensive first team with like a bit a bit of ball control. I, I think you should take more shots this year than I think what Justin Fields was taking, right? And uh, in terms of like big playability, you should have more explosive plays and all those things. But uh, it, it's still going to come down to a field position battle. And when your quarterback has a bad three and out and then your defense gets to take over on the 10 instead of on the 40 or on the 30, that's a big deal. The anecdote that I saw, Richard Hightower, who's the Bears special teams coordinator, he said he knows for a fact three other teams that he has spoken to and their special teams coordinators that were ready to take uh, Tory Taylor in the fourth. So they said that if you hadn't taken him, I don't know how much that's accurate and what the hyperbole behind, you know, all that is, but that's what he said. And, you know, I'm, who am I to question uh, an actual NFL coach and what he says. And one more funny thing to kind of point out that we, we discuss in private, I think a bit more, we might've mentioned it on here a few times, but the randomness and the luck of being an, an NFL GM. And we praise these guys for being geniuses and putting together these amazing drafts year after year, right? The Eagles, the Niners and John Lynch and all these guys, man, Ryan Poles really did just luck into probably the best NFL situation, right? Uh, like we've been talking about, if the Panthers were just a little bit better and you picked sixth and ninth or seventh and ninth, you're probably still taking a quarterback. You're still probably taking JJ McCarthy and you're probably taking Roma Dunze and you're still excited and you're still hyped up and everything, but you got the number one bar none prospect in this year's draft and you get to walk out of that. So the hype off season is now beginning and you, no matter what, like even if Caleb Williams doesn't end up being the best quarterback in this class, which is super possible. It's still super fun to speculate and you should be a good team, but man, the, the randomness and the luck of the draft too, right? The Paxton Lynch uh, led chiefs and then how that turned into Patrick Mahomes story. That's always an interesting one, but Ryan Poles, you, you got lucky. You got the first pick in a, in a generational quarterback class. For people who don't know, uh, just to deliberate on that a little bit more, um, Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs called the Broncos and tried to trade up to pick three because they really wanted Paxton Lynch. And the Broncos denied him, and the Chiefs stayed put. That year they wound up taking Chris Jones. The next year they still need a quarterback. They wound up coming up and getting Patrick Mahomes. So, you know, they could have had Paxton Lynch, though, right? That's who they wanted. So it just goes to show you what, you know, Sometimes you just need a little stroke of luck. Sometimes you need to be saved from yourself a little bit. I think it's hilarious that you told me earlier in the week that uh, the reason why Kirk Cousins moved down from Minnesota was because they told him they had plans of drafting a quarterback. And, uh, you got some you got some bad news for you, buddy. Put yourself in a completely unfamiliar situation, surrounded by guys that you know you haven't played with, haven't juggled with at all, and mm -hmm. still get a quarterback drafted. Higher than the Vikings drafted theirs. <laughs> yeah, really kicked them in the ass there, huh? Atlanta, like, I, I don't know. I'm not as – I see their weapons and I see uh, the offensive talent there, but uh, you're going to have to – you're going to have to really convince me to take any of their players in fantasy football this year. And then on top of that, like, man, what a what a badly managed team in my opinion, I guess. It's just one of the – they could end up being geniuses and being correct. Like Bijan Robinson could be just a top 10 running back in the league. And Kyle Pitts could have a resurgence, I suppose. And if Kirk Cousins stays healthy, if, 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 but um, a lot of things have to happen right for the Falcons. Otherwise that's a, uh, that is one, uh, that is not a, a fan base I'm envious of. I feel bad for them as fans. It's the whole circus of an off season we just went through with the whole Caleb Williams, Justin Fields thing and everything. I remember during one episode, I told you like, Man, like, get some nasty comments from people. And you're like, dude, these are just people that can't live outside the moment, right? Like, they're, they're just living it today and, and can't even see forward. He goes, these are going to be the same people that the second we draft Caleb Williams wind up painting their nails and this and that. And wouldn't you know it, wouldn't you know it, some of the biggest supporters of Justin Fields that were some of the biggest haters of Caleb Williams just because they supported Justin Fields. Or have already, you know, turned their heads and are starting to get excited about Caleb Williams. It does feel nice to be on the same page at the same time. It's just like, yeah, you know, at least now I know who's who in this process, right? Like, but it's interesting because the kid is completely the opposite of whatever the media drew up on him. I mean, it, it pretty much it's it's almost like disgusting. Look back at like. This kid has been such a top-notch leader from the second he got drafted. 
I mean, you're talking about him staying through the draft, calling the other draft picks, te- texting the other draft picks, getting in touch with his teammates right away, like from the second he got drafted. Uh, you you can tell Caleb Williams is all in on football, and I fucking love that. We've said it for a while. We're we're kind of sick of having the Boy Scout as a quarterback, and I'm I'm all for having a quarterback that I'm a fan of because I like him as a person. Mitch Trubisky was an awesome person. Like he was a really cool guy. He was down to earth and hard worker. This that and the other and Justin Fields being really nice guy and hard worker and great guy. I'm fine with disliking Caleb Williams a little bit if he makes my favorite football team a playoff contender every single year. I'm fine with disliking him as a quarterback. Go look at uh, Green Bay Packers fans towards the end of the Aaron Rodgers regime. They were ready to move on from him. They were kind of sick of him and how they, how he kind of held the team hostage for a few years and how he acted. But I guarantee they weren't upset on Sundays when he was thrown for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. So again, I'm, I'm okay with the Caleb. I'm not a gatekeeper here. Also, like you wanted to change your mind about Caleb Williams. That's your prerogative. I mean, it is what it is for myself would rather be a little bit more level-headed and not have to contradict myself just because my opinions changed after a while. Um, We've always approached this from, we love Justin Fields. We'd love for him to be better, but if he's not, you got to just move on and you got to always keep trying until you hit the nail on the head. I said okay. that to you, I think the one day where we were talking about that pivot interview, right? The pivot with Ryan Clark and all those guys. I watched that and I came out of it thinking this is one of the most egregious, uh, I forget what you call those, like a sabotaging of, of a person's character, right? Like just the an absolute trying to slander, slander, just a slander up. job. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Like a slander job. I forget. There's like a, a term for that. Something job like slam. Like it, it was weird how much they tried to get really nitpicky um, with the, the really, really detailed stories. And it's one of those things. If he was a worse prospect, you'd be worried about the fact that he can't uh, get the, rid of the ball fast enough, that he maybe extends plays too much, that he gets hit too many times this and that but you couldn't find anything to criticize so you criticize his fingernails and how he hugs his mom and cries um and then you know you talk about those things and you see the interview and he he gives you a reasonable explanation and i think any person who would have an actual conversation with a human like that and they explain it the way he does if you have a problem with it still i don't really understand you as a person right like my mom's a beautician she wanted to paint her nails and i never found it strange so she practiced on me and i got used to it and i liked it what's the big deal Great. That's a great logical person. The way he explained it was, you know, he, he had an emotional game. He was holding a stern face. And then I think I related to this where he said, the moment my mom hugged me and she said, like, it's OK. He's like, the waterworks just hit. Anybody who's ever had like a bad day at work and then you get home and it all kind of added up and you were fine throughout the day. And then one day you just get home and bam, and you just fall apart. So I, I like the guy. He seems very down to earth. He seems just like a person that's very comfortable in his own body and his own skin. And, you know, and that's, that's important in life. And, and frankly, what I care about is football. I think we've said this from day one. Like, damn, man, can the kid throw a football? Can he, can he play the quarterback position? Can he process well? Can he get, like you said, release time? Can he get rid of the ball quick? Make the right choices. Let's see it. You know what I mean? One of my good friend's sisters that got married up in Milwaukee, and I'm there with his family, and his, his dad has had season tickets for over 50 years. Uh, so they've been going to games their whole entire life, you know, him and his brother and his dad. And we're outside talking, and we all kind of just came to the same conclusion. Okay, listen, been there, done that. I get it. It's changed. We've been there. We've done that. Oh, new quarterback. Get it. Been there, done that. Like, we need to see it. We need to see it. As fans, like, this is what we deserve now. Like, we need to go out there, and, you know, there can't – there can't be too many slumps. Like we need this thing to go and we deserve it. Like bears fans in general deserve a lot of success from their football team moving forward. And it does look like this team is in position to do so. It's got to get done. Like they got to go out there. They got to execute. They got to go do it. And, I, and that's, that's what's important to me, man. I want to go out there and see some wins this next year and come out of it at the end of the year, feeling good about my team. I know a lot of people mention playoffs. For me, it's, it's not even that it's going to be like way more, you know, in depth criticism on the way things go down. So like, for example, I want to see the way Caleb 
handles the offense? Is he in control? Does he feel comfortable? Is he throwing picks at the end of the game? You know what I mean? Like that would be concerning. Clutch moments, things like that. Is the defense letting fourth quarter leads slip again? That would be concerning. Like there's just things to how the games play out that I think are going to matter to me more than the overall record itself or any kind of statistical numbers. So expectations change very quickly in during NFL seasons. That's why, right? Every team, like you just said, has uh, Super Bowl hopes going into training camp. Oh my God, they look amazing in training camp. Did you see that? We went undefeated in preseason. And very, very quickly, you go 0-4 as a team, and you're eliminated from playoff contention, essentially. Or you are one of those teams that's 4-0, like the Giants were two years ago, and everybody's thinking, wow, this could be our year, and then you end up going 9-8, and bouncing the first round of the playoffs. It is what it is. My expectations will have to put them out there eventually, but I'm not ready to do that yet. We don't even know about last-minute signings. Uh, Tyler Boyd got signed today by the Titans, right? So, like, Teams are changing very, very quickly. Um, you're still going to add players. You're going to add uh, training camp cuts, and somebody's going to get hurt. We, we've talked about that before, right? There's going to be a, a team-changing, season-changing injury in training camp for somebody. So it's going to change very quickly. And four games in, I'll, I can reevaluate and say what my actual season-wide expectation is, um, even if they're like two and two, because me and you are going to dissect you know, the, the finer things that we see. I really hope that things click well with Eberflus and Waldron. And that was probably my biggest concern going into this season because you got handed the keys to a Ferrari and you don't know how to drive a stick. That Eberflus I have less worries about, and I think Eberflus truly saved his own job at the end of last year. We talked about it throughout the season at the end of last year about if this defense keeps playing like this or whatnot, um, that he deserves another chance. We still landed, I think, on the move on. Right, I think yeah, we both I landed still, on that. But. I still would have kind of liked to see a complete overhaul. I, I kind of would have. I guess in retrospect, I don't know where you would have gone. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury would have been a probably pretty dangerous, very risky. I would probably feel less safe with Cliff Kingsbury and Caleb Williams than I do with, for example, keeping Eberflus and giving him a good offensive coordinator. That's still going to be my biggest concern is um, – how Waldron and Williams communicate, who feels in charge, how well does each other know the playbook and how well do they know what complements each other. Um, just knowing the few things I've known about Caleb Williams, reading the snippets and things like that, I'm excited for the potential idea of Caleb Williams being more in charge. And I think that's something that we really, really missed with Fields and Getsy is Getsy really just had carte blanche. Like, whatever you think is right, we'll do it your way. And that's just – that was one of my biggest criticisms of Fields. I think the first time we saw Justin Fields yell back at his headset was maybe week 14 or something, and it was that, like, goodbye in tour. Three. In year <laughs> three. And it was that goodbye tour of Justin Fields. Um, and that was the first time I was like, finally, I wish you had spoken up week two when you got two screens in a row against Tampa, what were, what were you doing? Right? Like you yell back. Right. Like if you have a problem with what's being called for you, say something, do something, be a leader, know the playbook so well that you can't be uh, told what to do without agreeing with it. Right. You can't just say, I ran this play because coach called it. If you, that uh, it was one of the things Tom Brady said in many of his interviews, if you knew this play was not going to work and you still just called it and reacted and then you blame the play calling, that's not a play calling issue. That's a you issue. You're a quarterback. You're the captain on the field. You should be maneuvering and managing and all that stuff. Caleb Williams, to me, seems like he's wired like a psychopath, like one of those amazing. And I say that in the most complimentary way. Peyton Manning was an absolute psycho. Tom Brady, total psycho. These guys were just so football, football, football that they sat there and studied the playbook so well that they probably could have recited it better than the offense coordinator. And at certain points probably did. And therefore, you know, over uh, called, you know, called the play over their OC at certain points. And it worked for them because that's how well they knew it. Yeah. During the roast of Tom Brady, I think Brett Kaiser and Tom Segura probably had one of the worst, you know, comical segments of that entire thing. But, um, but I understood it. I mean, they were trying to call Tom Brady a psychopath. They like compared him to like Ted Bundy and like Hitler and stuff. It was pretty, it was pretty cringe. But at the end of the day, they're like, thank God you played football and not, 
<laughs> you know, to, to decided to do something else because you are a psychopath. So, and I, I, I get that, man. We